following interview was conducted with Stanislav Graf, professor of psychology at the California Institute of Inter, uh, Integral Studies um, at the uh, Institute of Psychology, Cosmology, and Consciousness, San Francisco, for the uh, Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, September 4, 2009, at Purdue in the, the TV studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good morning. And I thank, thank you, you for having me. It's a okay. pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Well, I was born in uh, Prague on the 1st of July, 1931. Uh, um, I, have a, I have a younger brother, four and a half years younger. Okay. Um, what was, well, tell us a little bit about grade school and high school and some of the... Well, I studied uh, what would be the equivalent of high school, we call it actually gymnasium. Okay. It's, here has a somewhat different meaning. And then I studied medicine in... Uh, Prague at uh, Charles University School of Medicine okay. and uh, did um, psychiatric residency and then uh, later I also got a PhD degree which was called uh, Doctor of Philosophy in Medicine and that was from the Czechoslovakian Academy of Sciences. Okay. Uh, let's back up to high school. Were there any activities that you were in? Then you went from high school right into medical school? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we don't have college. We don't have. You didn't have pre med then. We don't right? have college. No, you start. You start uh, medicine when you are eighteen years old. And okay, all right. And it's six years. Study. Um, is this also in Prague? This was in Prague. Okay. Yes. Did Did you live on uh, on campus when you were uh, going to school? No, no, I lived at home. And okay. There was a walking distance to the uh, university. Yeah. Okay. What well, about the high school? Was that was that close? And so, were there were there any? This students? was also. There was basically around the corner. Yeah. Okay. How large a school was it? You mean how? Well, there were quite a few students in there. Uh, in the quite school. a few. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. But I wouldn't. I can't give you the number. Uh, that's okay. Point. That's fine. Yeah. Um, and then um, you did some. Uh, got a. Fellowship for the Soviet Ministry of Public Health. Did you afterwards? That was when I already was a psychiatrist. It was an exchange uh, program. Okay. So I spent a couple months in the Soviet Union, and then uh, I was working in Leningrad at the Bechterev Institute. Okay. Then there was a visit to some of the major institutes in Moscow, and then uh, I spent uh, several weeks in Suhumi, which was uh, in Georgia on the on uh, Black Sea, okay. which was a very interesting place with a um, study of, of monkeys, of the experimental neurosis in monkeys, in okay. the bab baboon, hematrius baboon, yeah. Okay. But you started earlier then, you were with the Psychiatric Research Institute in Prague. Is, is that what you did after you got your degree? Your MD? Uh, no, I first okay. uh, went for three years in a, After you this got was your like MD? A residency in a, in a state mental hospital. In the okay. It were in Czechoslovakia. In, in yeah, I already started doing research while I was working there. I was commuting between Prague and this place, which was about 60 miles from Prague. Oh, yeah. okay. All righty. But uh, where did you, and you got, you got your PhD also there in, in, in medicine, is that right? That was called uh, Doctor of Philosophy in Medicine, yeah. Okay, okay. And then, then what came after that? After you got that, um, we came to the United. Well, I did the I did the residency, and then uh, uh, there was a newly built uh, psychiatric research institute in Prague. So I was, you know, one of the one of the early members of that, and that's where I started uh, really the systematic psychedelic research. Okay. Okay. All righty. Um, then th from the sixties, and then. Does, uh, d d was the next stage when you came to the United States, or, or how did that Yeah, I worked uh, in uh, the Psychiatric Research Center in Prague between 60 and 67. Okay. And then I got the scholarship. I went to the United States, 65. I traveled around. Uh, I gave a talk, at, uh, um, among others, at uh, Yale. And I was offered to come back on a scholarship for for a year. At Yale? It was a scholarship from the Foundation's Fund of Research in Psychiatry in New Haven. Okay. 
and so I came back for a year and then it was extended for another year and then during the second year the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia you know the liberalization got so far that the Russians felt they couldn't control the country politically anymore and uh, so we were all asked to come back immediately and I refused to go back I stayed okay all right then after the two years at Yale what what came next then tell us the threads that what came after that no, I, after it wasn't this was the scholarship was oh, from scholarship. Yale oh okay but it was actually to Johns Hopkins okay so I was for two years at Johns Hopkins as a, a fellow as a research fellow and uh, then after that I became a, a assistant professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins and uh, also chief of psychiatric research at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. Okay, well tell us a little about that and what, about your teaching. Did you do some teaching as well? Yes, I was, I was basically working part-time in this research at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center and I was also teaching at Johns Hopkins. Okay. Um, can you want to talk a little bit about the research that uh, that you were involved in there, for the researchers? Uh, it was very interesting because I was uh, invited by Dr. Joel Alkis actually to start another psychedelic research program at Johns Hopkins. And I arrived in Baltimore and it was a week after this very alarming um, paper was published by Maimon Cohen uh, who found some changes in the uh, lymphocytes when he added uh, LSD to the lymphocytes in a test tube and that created this um, kind of hysteria about possible impact on heredity and so on. So Dr. Alkis didn't want to start a new research project until this would be cleared and it just happened that uh, there was the last surviving psychedelic research project was in Baltimore in the same city. So then I got this arrangement when I was teaching half-time at Johns Hopkins and, and joined this group which was already doing research. Okay. So yeah. this was basically the last surviving uh, government-sponsored research of psychedelics. And um, it's very, very interesting. There were several groups of people. One was uh, uh, chronic alcoholics from the Alcoholic Rehabilitation Unit. The second was a, a group of heroin addicts taken from uh, prison. We had a large group with, uh, of uh, neurotic patients. And then the two most interesting projects were, one was uh, the possibility of give training sessions to professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, uh, social workers, uh, ministers who did pastoral counseling and so on. And then uh, probably the most interesting was the work with uh, terminal cancer patients, trying to find out if mystical experiences induced by psychedelics would take away the fear of death and change the, the experience of dying. So you had quite a different, uh, different groups that you were, were yes. working with then. Yeah. Okay. Um, did, and at the same time, was at this time you were also the, uh, that scholar in residence at the Esalen Institute? Or was that afterwards? No, that was, that was afterwards. Okay. Uh, it was like in 1973, uh, it became increasingly difficult to get uh, funds for this kind of research. And uh, by that time, I had a very large uh, amount of research material. And, and uh, I was contacted in a month by 12 publishers to write a book on LSD. So I decided to take a year off and go, uh, you know, to write uh, write a uh, couple of Do books. Book. Right. And I went to a party in uh, New York City, and I met there uh, uh, Michael Murphy, who was the co-founder of Esalen, whom I had met actually in '65 during my first visit sure. at Esalen. And we started talking, and I told him that I got this advance from Viking Press, and that uh, I'm going to work on a couple of books. And he says, why don't you come to Esalen? You know, Esalen is a beautiful place uh, to write books. It's a, it's a beautiful property which is on uh, uh, the west coast, you know, between, between Monterey and uh, Los Angeles. And uh, it's between the mountains and the, 
uh, the Pacific Ocean, old Indian grounds. Esalen is the name of the of the tribe that was there. So, so those were sacred grounds of the Indians. They have hot springs. It's a very beautiful place. Nice place to do some writing and research, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he says, why don't you come and, you know, we'll give you a house and, uh, and uh, basically room and board and you will do some workshops. Uh, it will be a trade-off. Sure. And so I, I spent a year there and by the time I was so hooked on uh, Pixar and California that I couldn't imagine going back to Baltimore, which, uh, you know, was not the very, uh, not the most beautiful city. And here was a situation where you, you know, every morning and evening you can go take a bath in the hot springs. You watch the whales to go by and the monarch butterflies. For so researchers, uh, what sort of, in, uh, just clarify what type of institute that is. I'm thinking of some people that might read the transcript, but just a yeah. clarification. It, um, originally it was actually a um, motel, which was which was built uh, at the time when uh, the Highway 1 was open, the scenic highway Along on the, the highway Pacific coast. coast. Uh, it was The property was owned by Dr. Murphy, who actually bought it uh, at a time when you had to use mules to get there. There was no highway yet. But when the highway uh, opened, they built a motel, which um, were for, for people traveling up and down the coast, and a special um, kind of fringe benefit were the hot springs that people, you know, people could have a bath and get a massage and so on. And then, um, when uh, at the time when Dr. Murphy uh, died, Michael Murphy, his son, was in uh, Oroville, in the Aurobindo Ashram in India, meditating, and he got the uh, rep you know report from. Uh, California that his father died and then he inherited a motel and he says well I really don't want to run a motel <laughs> so he was thinking what what to do with that beautiful property and he connected with uh, Dick Price and they decided to uh, create a kind of a human potential center where people who develop some uh, methods that are too revolutionary for universities or research institutes or some more traditional places could go and give workshops and, uh, you know, um, and experiment with these new methods. Hmm. So it's basically like the first human potential center. It's quite, quite extraordinary because it's just a small strip of land between the mountains and, sure. and at the same time it contributed more to psychology, you know. Uh, since the 60s than uh, any university I know. Was doing in a research institute. Nice. Basically, uh, you know, Virginia Satir was associated with Esalen who developed uh, family therapy. Uh, Will Schutz, who was very instrumental in the group therapy movement. Fritz Perls, who developed uh, Gestalt therapy. Uh, Ida Rolf developed Rolfing and so on. So it was a very, very exciting. Sounds like quite an active yeah. operation they had out there. People were basically interesting. People were coming from all over the world. So. Sure. Okay. And you got your books written while you were out there? I wrote a couple of books, and then you know, then I stayed and wrote more. Right. Yeah. Well, that brings it up to that uh, California Institute of Integral Studies at the Institute of Psychology, and that's where you're currently affiliated. Yes. Could you talk yes. a little bit about that? What uh, your uh, responsibilities and the research? Interest. Well, I'm, you know, I'm uh, not uh, really on the staff there. Uh -huh. I didn't want the responsibility of going to staff meetings and so on. So it's more or less like a, a contractual thing. Okay. I, I just come and do teach the courses, uh, but I don't what, have any. What's the type of the facility? What what sort of things did? It's uh, it started actually work. as a um, um, in the California Institute of. Uh, Asian studies. It was um, it started by Haridas Chaiduri, who was an uh, Aurobindo scholar, and so they were doing a lot of courses related to Asian uh, religions and spiritual systems and so on. And then it became uh, California Institute of Integral Studies when it started including consciousness research, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. new paradigm, and so on. 
It's a very, very kind of avant-garde school. Okay. And it's located in San Francisco. It's then. offering, it's credited, it's offering PhDs and, and MAs. Okay. Is it primarily graduate work that they yes. do there? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit, when, talk a little bit about your research, what you're currently involved in and some other aspects that you've done over time that researchers could benefit by. Well, my, my interest in psychiatry started by reading Freud. I initially wanted to go to um, animated movies. I like to paint and draw. And uh, I already had my interview. I was accepted. I was supposed to start working in the film studios in Prague. And uh, just at that time, a friend, a friend of mine gave me introductory lectures to psychoanalysis and kind of read it practically overnight. And I decided this is what I would Want to do. do. So I enrolled in the medical school and, you know, became a psychiatrist. And then uh, by the time I became a psychiatrist, I was already disenchanted because I realized the limitations of psychoanalysis, how long it takes, how how narrow the indication range was, how very special criteria you have to meet, not the, not the last being a lot of money and uh, a lot of time. And uh, I realized that the, the results were not exactly breathtaking. So I got to a point where I started kind of thinking nostalgically back at the animated movies, feeling this was a wrong decision I should have stayed with my original intention. <laughs> And um, we were just finishing a large study of malaria, which was one of the early tranquilizers. And this was the beginning like, of, of this pharmacological era in, in uh, psychiatry. The, this, the early tranquilizers, antidepressants, and the idea that all problems in psychiatry would be eventually solved by substances, by drugs. And uh, so we just finished a large study with Melaril, which was one of the early tranquilizers. And this came from Switzerland, from, from Sandoz. So we had a good working relationship, you know, which means they pay your trip to conferences, they send you some free literature, and they also send you samples of some substances that they develop. Sure. And so as part of this cooperation, one day, this department when I was working, I uh, got a large Prague? box. In Prague, is it still? Uh, yeah, this uh -huh. was in Prague. Uh, the psychiatric clinic in Prague. Uh, it got this large box full of ampules, and it says LSD-25. So this was a very interesting uh, investigation, a new substance. The powerful psychoactive effects of this substance were discovered by Dr. Albert Hoffman, who actually accidentally intoxicated himself when he was uh, when he was synthesizing this substance and um, uh, they say Dr. Stoll in Zurich who was the the son of uh, Dr. Albert's boss did a pilot study and published a paper in 49 that kind of became an overnight sensation because of the incredible efficacy the incredible power you know, really micrograms or millions of a gram mm -hmm. can change the functioning of the psyche for six to eight hours. So this Dr. Stoll uh, did a pilot study and uh, now Sandoz was sending samples to different institutions saying, you know, it seems like this is something that could be interesting for psychiatrists, for psychologists. Would you work with this substance and let us know if you feel that there's some legitimate use for it. And they gave us two uh, tips, you know, how they felt it could be used. One was to use it as what they called experimental psychosis, that you could take a group of people, quote unquote, healthy people, normal people, and you would give them the substance, do all kinds of examinations before, during and after, biochemical, electrophysiological, psychological tests and so on, do it before, during, and after, and get some sense of what's happening biochemically, biologically, electrophysiologically, and so on, when the psyche functions in this very unusual way. And the basic idea was that we would get insights into naturally occurring uh, psychosis, that uh, 
you know, psychosis would not really be mental diseases, they would be aberrations of body chemistry. Because if, if a substance in, in millions of a gram could change the psyche so profoundly, it was conceivable that the body chemistry could produce something like that and actually intoxicate the, the brain. There would be nothing wrong with the brain itself. And uh, so the, the exciting idea was if that is true, if we could find that substance, then we could also find another substance that would uh, neutralize it, that would sort of uh, um, um, counteract the effect of the substance. And we would have like a test tube solution for schizophrenia, you know, for psychosis, which is a, like a holy grail, it would be holy grail of, of psychiatry. And then they gave also a second tip, which kind of became my destiny, or karma, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> they said that they also felt that this could be a very interesting, unconventional educational tool that psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, students could take the substance and spend a few hours in a world that seemed to be very much like the world of their patients. And that we would learn a lot about this world and that we would be able to understand these patients better, we would be able to communicate with them more effectively and, and hopefully be more effective in treating them. So I was now experiencing this crisis, you know, and uh, so I got very excited and, you know, became one of the early volunteers in Prague and had just a session that um, just changed my life and sent my my professional life also in a completely different direction. Okay. And you continued on with this? Uh, what are you currently? Yeah, I, you know, I had uh, an experience where, uh, which was combined also with exposure to powerful stroboscopic light because my preceptor was very interested in electroencephalography. So everybody who wanted to have the, the experience had to agree that you know, they would have their EEG done, but uh, he was also specifically interested in what's called entraining or, or um, driving the brain waves, which is exposing people to stroboscopic light of certain frequencies and to find out if the brain waves in the occipital area would pick up the frequency that you are feeding in, if you can basically drive them or entrain them change the functioning of the brain by exposure to these frequencies. And he wanted to know how LSD would change that. So we also had to agree to have our brain waves driven as part of that experiment. So what happened practically that uh, when my session was culminating between the second and the third hour, this research assistant came and said it was time to, for the experiment to drive the brain waves. And she took me to a small cell. I lay down. She put um, electrodes on my scalp and asked me to close my eyes and then turn on this gigantic uh, stroboscope. And in the next moment, there was, although my eyes were closed, there was light like I had never seen in my life. I couldn't even imagine existed, you know. At the time, I thought this is what it must have been like in Hiroshima when the bomb went off. Hmm. And uh, I sort of thought about the, the writings of mystics, like they talk about millions of suns and so on. Uh, this incredible supernatural light. And uh, my consciousness was just catapulted out of my body. I lost the research assistant, I lost the clinic, I lost Prague. And I had the feeling that my consciousness had no more boundaries. I had the feeling I became all there was. And then coming down, uh, I, at one point, I, in a sense, I was in the physical universe. Uh, in, in some sense, I had the feeling I was the universe. Uh, there were things happening for which I even didn't have names at the time. Later, I read about the Big Bang and the black holes and, you know, something in that, in that category. Mm. And uh, mm. then she turned the strobe off and my consciousness started shrinking again. I found Prague, I found my body, and for some time I couldn't get consciousness together with my body. 
And it was clear to me that what they taught me in the medical school was not true, that consciousness was somehow a product uh, of the brain. It was clear that it could somehow operate uh, independently. We see something similar now in near-death situations. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanatological studies, you know, the consciousness can go out of the body and you can see things in other places or, or you can watch things from the ceiling and so on. So it was an experience like, like that coming down before it was really a cosmic, cosmic consciousness. Sure, and then finally I managed to get the two together and sort of, you know, come land it safely. And I was very impressed and I felt, you know, I'm already stuck with psychiatry and the, if you are a psychiatry, this is by far the most interesting thing you can study. So it's now, this was 56, so it's now well over half a century. And I have really done very little professionally that would not be related to these non-ordinary states. Okay. About half of the time was the clinical work with psychedelics. And when uh, we couldn't do it anymore, and when I was at Essel and we didn't have the permission, so uh, my wife and I developed what we call holotropic breath work. Yes, that's another thing I was going yeah, to tell about that. We just work with faster breathing and powerful music. No drugs are used, and people still have very similar kind of powerful, powerful uh, experiences. And then over the years, we also worked with a lot of people who had spontaneous experiences like this. And uh, we found out that you can basically work with those states in the same way we did with psychedelics or with the breath work. That actually, the last thing you would want to do is to suppress those states with tranquilizers, because if you can support them properly, they can be transformative, they can be, mm -hmm. they can be healing. So we believe now there's a certain significant subgroup of states which are diagnosed as psychosis, which are really like crisis of uh, spiritual opening. And we call them spiritual emergencies. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And you give uh, training on with that, don't you, with the breathing or? We now, you know, my main uh, main focus now is on teaching this method mm -hmm. to people who become facilitators. So we have trained over a thousand people all over the world to actually practice this. You know, lead the groups with the with this breath work. What what are the part uh, participants? What uh, what is the group that you're doing the training for? That you provide well, that. you know, some of them would be psychiatrists, okay. psychologists, uh, um, but there are also others. Anthropologists come because they want to learn about non-ordinary states. Uh, mm -hmm. We had uh, clergy who were interested in experiencing spiritual experiences. Uh, right. And, so it's quite know, of a cross-section of various yeah, types that, would, yeah. that could benefit by this. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little about family. Um, your wife helps you with this. And want to talk about? Do you have any children? Uh, I don't have children of my own. Okay. No, uh, but I, uh, you know, I basically uh, consider my my wife's children to be mine. They okay. Did you meet your wife yeah. here in this country? In uh, yeah, in okay. the United States in okay. California. She grew up in Honolulu. Oh, okay. So that's close by, and right? So <laughs> she o she already had a, f uh, f you know, when we when we met uh, the. The daughter was five years and the son was seven, so they're very much like my children. And oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Does she still have? Do you travel to Hawaii at all? Does she still have family there or relatives? Well, her, her uh, mother had a house in in uh, Honolulu, so uh -huh. we used to spend a lot of time there on vacations. You know, nice spot. In, yeah, <laughs> beautiful. Right. It was right on the ocean, overlooking the Diamond Head. So it was very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's talk, um, you, you have quite a few publications. Do you have anything in the works at the moment that you're working on? Well, we finally, after using the holotropic breathwork for many years, we finally are writing a uh, handbook on the theory and practice of this okay. holotropic breathwork. Good. And is it, uh, when do you expect to have it published? Pretty soon? Or? Well, the, the manuscript is going to the publisher within a month or so. so. Very good. Whatever it takes them, nine we'll months. We look forward probably. to getting a copy. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I'll certainly send a copy. Here, yeah. <laughs> uh. I'm also writing another book, which is already done. It's being printed, and it's uh, on a Swiss painter 
uh, Hans Rudi Giger, who you probably know as somebody who got uh, Austin, an Oscar, the Academy Award for the art to the movie Alien. And also, have you seen the movie? No, no. I haven't, uh, but I recognize what you're and, talking about. And uh, inspired, actually, the, there's a whole series of these Alien 1 to 5. So, so he is a you know, very, very interesting artist, and uh, it's very much uh, inspired by the trauma of birth. So a lot of his paintings show, you know, scenes of deliveries, babies, and so on. And so uh, I used it to show how you get deeper understanding of art when you use this extended cartography that emerged out of uh, this work of non-ordinary states. Because uh, current psychiatry and psychology has this Freudian model, which really is limited to postnatal biography, to what happened during nursing, toilet training, you know, the Oedipus problems, and Electra problems, and so on. Uh, so the whole psychological history starts after we are born. And this work has shown that there is a powerful record of all the stages of birth that we went through, prenatal life, and then also uh, kind of a realm that we now call transpersonal. There's a whole, uh, you know, new discipline called transpersonal psychology mm -hmm. that I w have been very much involved with. And so I'm using the, his art as an example how you get a much deeper understanding of the content of art if you expand the cartography, if you don't try to explain everything just from childhood and, and sure. infancy. Yeah. All right. I noticed you were consulted on experimental sequences for that Hollywood science fiction brainstorm. Yes. Can you yeah. tell us a little about how that, uh, what exactly what, that we were involved in? Well, we, uh, I had a f slideshow, which was a kind of a death rebirth slideshow. Sure. You know, um, very, very powerful with, with music and so on. And um, Doug Trumbull, who was a kind of this uh, special effect genius who did uh, worked with Kubrick on 2001, and uh, he also uh, worked on the and Andromeda strain, uh, Blade Runner, and other sure. movies. So he was the, direct, the director of this movie called Brainstorm, which was a very fascinating story of uh, two uh, inventors who invent a helmet, and when you experience something, you can record the electric potentials, and another person can get the helmet and have your experience. And what happened in the movement is uh, in the in the movie is that uh, one of the uh, researchers who developed it was working late at night and had a heart attack, and decided to record that. And they came in the morning and she was dead, but the tape was still rolling. So they realized they recorded a death experience. Interesting. And so he heard about the slideshow, so he came, watched the slideshow, and then. Uh, basically invited us to be uh, consultants for the special effects. So he wanted to use the best special effects existing at the time, which sure. was nothing like what they have today with right. the digital yeah. technology, right. but still pretty good. Right. And he wanted to combine it with what we know about death and actually portray death in a very realistic, realistic way. So um, he brought the crew to Esalen to our five-day workshop and they did the breath work with us uh, and uh, because there was a you know tremendous emphasis on the death experience Natalie Wood was part of that and uh, Chris walk in there so uh, there was a scene at the end where he is having this experience and she is there as a supporting team so they wanted us to to give these experiences to the whole team sure. so that they knew what they were uh, working so the uh, there was Louise Fletcher was there, you know that she was the I don't recognize her. She was um, nurse wretched in One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, okay, and, uh, okay. And then Cliff Cliff Robertson was there. Uh, then um, and John Foreman was the producer, you know. So so they did the, this breathwork. Uh, Natalie didn't want to do the breathwork because she was too big a star, she was a kind of a, an exposure. So we then later did this work with her privately and with, with Chris Walken when we were in, oh, okay. uh, 
in uh, Raleigh in North Carolina on location. That was kind of a and nice we had a chance experience. to spend 10 days at Hollywood when, sure. when they were just quite a fascinating experience. I would imagine. <laughs> Unfortunately, Natalie would drown while the movie was, because you know, they, they went for this trip uh, on the yacht near the, right. the Catalina Island, and she invited Chris Walken, and they were, uh, they were drinking, and somehow they got, the men got into a fight, and yeah. she walked out, and also with high level of alcohol. And yeah, she was lost. So there was a question whether the movie would be finished at all. Uh -huh. uh, MGM wanted to collect the $15 million from Lloyds of London, and Doug Trumbull convinced them that if they give him $3 million that he would finish it. But if you watch the movie, there's a, there's a, um, uh, you know, you know that something's missing. It's, it was not really smooth because the three because scenes the were, finishing part, what you're saying. the three scenes were quite, quite important scenes, so he didn't quite manage to bridge it. And the worst thing was that there was not enough money for the special effects that we were working on. So something that started as a very exciting project, you know, it became kind of yeah, not only not changes. only frustrating, but yeah. it had a tragic end. Right. Okay. Let's we were then invited to another one. We worked on the Millennium, which was not a great movie. So. Have, are you, have you done any lately? Any consulting lately? On no, that's already, okay. you know, came and went. <laughs> That was a good opportunity. It was, but there was travel through time, and we were working on those sequences, yeah. you know, of traveling through time. Sure. So. Okay. Um, I got a couple of awards I want to ask you about, but let's stop with the Vision 97, the Baklav and Dagmar Havel Foundation award you got in Prague. Tell us a little bit about the award, and how did, were you notified that you were going to be receiving it? Well, I got Very a nice. phone call. He has a, he has a brother who is uh, Ivan Havel, who is... Uh, really brilliant researcher in artificial intelligence. And we had connection with him and a group of, uh, of scientists uh, in Prague from the time when we did a large uh, international transpersonal conference in Prague. And Václav Havel was, uh, it was done under his auspices. He was supposed to welcome people, but couldn't come to the conference because it was just the day when Czechoslovakia was breaking and they were meeting in the parliament until three o'clock in the morning. Uh, but I had the connection with Ivan Havel and so he gave me the call, said that I was nominated and would I be willing to come to, you know, receive the, the award, which of course I was very excited to do. It's quite, quite remarkable considering that it's a still a controversial, very controversial area. And uh, this is a quite a prestigious award. It was first, the first one was given to uh, Václav Havel, uh, to, I'm sorry, to uh, Václav Havel, the one who gave it, Carl uh, um, Pribram, the neuro researcher who sure. developed the holographic model of the brain. And uh, there was uh, Umberto Eco was another one, uh, Philip Zimbardi from, uh, from Stanford, who did the prison project, and that's qu quite a very nice, quite a. Uh, they have a big yeah. they have a big ceremony, and where was it held? And one of very the very beautiful ceremony in a church that uh, they have renovated, and it's now like a spiritual center in Prague. So. Very nice, very very nice. Yeah. Did you spend some time there while you were over there as well? We spent about a week in Prague. Yeah, yeah. that's nice. And it was a very wonderful award, which is a large staff. It's a copy of the staff of St. Adalbert that was then sent and sort of hanging in our living room, you know. Sure, okay. Very good. Um, you also got that Association for Transpersonal Psychology an honorary award, too, yes. at one time. And I thought I'd ask you about the International Transpersonal Association. You were the founder and also the president. Talk a little about that association. Are you still it, uh, participating in it? Well, uh, transpersonal psychology started like in the late uh, 1960s. Okay. And uh, the two people who, who started the Transpersonal uh, Psychology Association uh, were also people who started humanistic psychology, Tony, Tony Sutich and uh, 
Abe Maslow, and uh, although humanistic psychology was very popular, within about 10 years, uh, they themselves got a uh, uh, strong sense that they left out something significant, which was the spiritual dimension. You know, also creativity, uh, meditation research, and so on. So they were considering creating yet another psychology, and they wanted to call it transhumanistic. And this was the time when we connected. I brought in the observations from psychedelic research. Abe Maslow had done a really large study of uh, hundreds of people who had spontaneous mystical experiences, what he called peak experiences. So we sort of uh, brainstormed that, and I became part of the founding group for the trans transpersonal psychology. And uh, transpersonal psychology uh, people were meeting every year in a Silomar, and then there were people from other countries started coming, and then we felt that it, it should actually expand and become an international uh, organization. And so this is where I came in. Mm -hmm. I was the founding, you know, founding president of this uh, ITA. We started it in uh, Belo Horizonte in Brazil during one of the transpersonal conferences, and then. Christina and I uh, organized eight large conferences in different parts of the world. That's a lot of work. Some, yeah, some in the United States, but also in in Melbourne, Australia, in uh, in the Amazon, in uh, in Manaus, uh, in Prague was another one. And there were some uh, other people who were organizing the uh, the rest of the conferences. Uh, Ralph Metzner, one in Killarney in, in uh, Ireland, and okay. Cecil Burney in Kyoto. There were uh, 16 conferences. Now the 17th is going to be next year in Moscow. Okay. So there are plans are underway for that one, I imagine. Yes. There oh, are. Okay. You're good. Um, you have to start early. Oh, you have to. That's yeah. right. Uh, and we mentioned before the uh, that uh, you were on the board of trustees, a member of the Esalen Institute, but you're you're not on the board any longer. Or? At the time when I was there, yeah. right? We oh, left in 1987. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about an outstanding event? Something that comes to mind that you'd like to share with us? Do you have an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with us with the researchers? Well, or you have more than one. Event. Uh, yeah. I will be. Um, going to Moscow at the beginning of November for uh, for a week again to do a lot of uh, to do it a large two day workshop theoretical workshop there's going to be a breath work and then you know a lot of television appearances and sure. uh, and basically trying to prepare for the next uh, conference in, uh, in Moscow it's like a PR event you know very good well that will be very nice yeah, yeah. So that's um, as you look look ahead and look back, I'll leave it uh, with some closing comments or that you'd like to, to make. I'll leave it with you, whatever you'd like to say in closing or wrap up. And um, well, I just you know, you know I have been very very excited uh, to see that every time there is a kind of a major breakthrough in science, that it's something that's welcomed by the people in the transpersonal circles, and it's somewhat sort of. Uh, surprising or uh, even embarrassing for the traditional uh, academic uh, circles. Uh, so it started with the in work like uh, Fritjof Capra, you know, the, the philosophical implications of quantum relativistic science, and then uh, Carl Pribram's uh, holographic model of the brain, and uh, David Bohm's holonomic uh, model, and uh, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, uh, new bi new biology uh, mm -hmm. of life, and then uh, the last my my last hero is Erwin Laszlo with his concept of uh, of what he now calls Akashic field, and but used to call PSI psi field. So it has been interesting to see. I believe that transpersonal psychology, that at the beginning was considered to be irrational, uh, unscientific, you know, is seems to be becoming part of a comprehensive new uh, new worldview. So I just uh, hope that, uh, you know, there would be a way of uh, really bringing it into the academic uh, sure. circles, because it's still sort of outside of, it's okay. outside of academia. 
and my my own personal uh, ambition would be uh, to continue what we started, you know, in in a somewhat frustrating way uh, with brainstorm to actually use now the new incredible digital technology to um, portray mystical experiences. I believe that you could not just portray them yet; you could you could induce them in people. You could give them mystical experiences, uh, combining what we know about these states and and the technology which is available. And it has been kind of disappointing to see how they are being used. You know, mostly uh, portraying in a brilliant way very destructive hmm. scenes. Once it's a dinosaur, the other time it's a, some kind of villain who's trying to destroy the earth, and then. Then uh, aliens come, and uh, it's a brilliant portrayal of the destruction. And then, uh, you know, the danger is overcome, and you end up with a trashed uh, planet. Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, so the, the chaotic scenes are okay, but they should be, should be sort of brought then to, to some kind of a uh, resolution, you know, spiritual, mystical resolution. And, uh, right. They okay. haven't been doing very well with that in that huh. department. The psychoactive substances collection, which is here in the archives, you want to make a comment on that? You've got some materials in there, correct? Well, it's a it's an effort to you know create a, um, a really create archives and also a library that res future researchers could right. could use. I think the very exciting thing is that uh, psychedelic research that kind of basically died for a number of years is, is uh, coming back. So there are now three major universities, UCLA, uh, Johns Hopkins, and uh, Harvard, who are now repeating the work that we did with hmm. cancer patients. They are not using LSD, they are using uh, psilocybin, which is a similar substance. Okay. Uh, you know, the active alkaloid of the magic mushrooms of the Mazatec Indians. And there's now a study going on with uh, MDMA with post-traumatic uh, syndrome. It's a, an area, you know, where basically there's no effective help available at the point, mm -hmm. at this point. And there are going to be enormous numbers of people needing this kind of help coming mm -hmm. from Iraq, from Afghanistan, and so on. And so those are very su successful studies, and I think it's a, it's a very um, promising kind of area. But so um, I hope that, that this uh, research is going to grow and that this Purdue Library is going to become more and more relevant, you know, as, sure. as it really as a, as a resource for new researchers. Very good. Very good. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Graf. I've really appreciated this, and I know yeah. the researchers will too. Thank you very Again, much. Again, thank you very much for it's having me. My pleasure. Yeah. <laughs>